What's going on everybody? My name is Tommy and I want to start off by sharing a verse. It says this, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When I first read this verse, I was actually in a men's home. I had um, just gave my life to Christ and I was doing the job that I was supposed to be doing there at this men's home and I saw this plaque. And I thought it was a poem at first because at the bottom of this verse, it said, fill, right? And then a dot and verse and, and the verse uh, reference. And I thought it was someone named Phil who wrote this verse, but it ministered to me as a brand new Christian, forgetting those things which are behind, which are past. And the reason why it ministered to me so much was because I had a lot in my past. I had a lot of baggage. I had a lot of stuff, you know, um, just from my growing up as a child and uh, the, the things that I experienced, even as a young little boy. You know, one of the horrific things that I experienced as a young little boy at the age of seven, I was sexually molested by, by a neighbor who lived a few uh, apartment complexes down. Um, fast forward from that, you know, there was... Uh, you know, I didn't really have Jesus in the home, didn't have anything about God in the home. There was like an awareness of God, but there was no relationship that I seen like from my parents um, or anything like that. And growing up in a broken home, there was a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion that I experienced as a young little child. Um, and I don't mean to say that my parents didn't love me. I know they did. I had a great family, but we were all lost. At the age of 13, I began to, um, you know, I'm the oldest of six children, and so I began to uh, just kind of hang out on the streets there in, the, in Los Angeles County, and I was quickly introduced to drugs, marijuana, and started drinking wine and beer at the age of like 13 and 14 years old. And, and then by the time I was 16 years old, here in like in the mid to late 80s, um, cocaine was everywhere, and it was something that I just gravitated towards, hanging out on the streets, doing a lot of cocaine, smoking cocaine, um, getting my hustle on, as people call it, you know, out there in the streets, just hustling cocaine on the streets and gang members and all that other stuff. And by the time I was 19, um, between 16 and 19, I, I met uh, my wife, who we're still married to uh, till, till, till this day, which is the grace of God, and we're still married. Um, we got married at a very young age. And uh, she was still in high school, as a matter of fact, when we got married. We were like, man, forget the prom. Let's just get married, right? And uh, that's kind of what we did. And so there was a, a whole lot there. And, and one of the things that I, as I look back um, on that season and that time of my life, you know, um, it was one thing was missing. It was Jesus. And everything else seemed to be available to me that, that was going to take away pain, take away um, insecurities, you know, take away fear, and that was drugs, alcohol, and kicking on the streets with the homies, you know, and all that other stuff. And and um, and I gravitated towards that. It was something that that I um, kind of you know even glorified in my mind. You know, this this kind of lifestyle of gangs and prison and drugs and and um, well, unfortunately, um, that wasn't. It was all a lie, and um, I spent. At the age of 19, I started going in and out of the LA County Jail. And a lot of times people think when you go to jail, at least there probably it does happen for some people, but for me, it didn't happen like that. I did not, you know, want to change my life or anything. And so I, I ended up spending about six years in the California State Penitentiary System, close to six years, not exactly six, but close. And, um, and while I was in there, my wife, she started going to church. And this now, this is in 19, about 1996, 1997. She, she started going to church and she started telling me about how her life has changed. And it didn't click in me. I didn't understand what she was talking about. And then um, I paroled in 2000. And when I paroled from prison, I was 29 years old. And, and there was a, all these emotions that I had as a child, all these, the fear and the, the, the insecurities and the emptiness and the darkness really on the inside, it, it, it all kind of bubbled to the surface, you know, no amount of drugs or alcohol was taking it away. And, and I remember I, I looked at, I was, one day I looked at myself in the mirror and 
I didn't like what I saw. You know, I didn't like the person and I just, I didn't care what happened to me. I was so empty and so lost. And um, my wife, though, during this time, she started telling me that God loves me and that she was going to continue to pray for me and that she believed that God had a plan for me. And I didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't click in my head. I was like, you know, if, if God exists, God likes good people. He doesn't like people like me because I did a lot of bad things, not only to her and, and to even to my own children and, and to my own family, but to straight up strangers, you know, and, and, um, and that was all, again, that was all a lie of the devil to keep me away from the grace of God. And so I paroled in January uh, 19th in the year 2000. And on June 11th of the year 2000, so a six-month period of me just kind of going through this, these motions and, and experiencing this emptiness that no amount of drugs and alcohol could take away or lifestyle, June 11th, I walked into a church. And I walked into this church on June 11th, not because I said, okay, this is going to be the day that my life is going to change. I walked into that church because... The day prior to that, my wife was upset with me, and um, I had gotten high, and, and I, after I'd made her some promises, and the parole uh, agents and the police you know, had raided my house, and a bunch of just stuff was going on, and, and, um, and so on June 11th, she was upset, and I said, man, I'll go to your church if you don't be mad at me, you know? And she was like, okay, well, come on, let's go. Little did I know that on that day, June 11th, that God was going to have a plan for me, and I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time with not just the ears of my, on the side of my head, but with the ears of my heart. And I remember having this overwhelming sense of um, feeling. I, I sensed the feeling of love and of grace, and I couldn't comprehend what was going on on the inside of me. All I knew was that I wanted it. I wanted that, whatever I'm beginning to experience. And I look back now and I know that was the power of God's Holy Spirit. That was the power of God's word and the power of the gospel and the message of the cross that, that was impacting me. And it was on that day I asked Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. I, I never said a sinner's prayer. I remember I was just crying. I could not stop crying, but it was a good cry. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it was one of those refreshing and good cries. And I just kept on saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God. And my son was there and I made a promise to him that I was going to be his daddy, that I wasn't going to leave him anymore. I didn't know how I was going to do that, but God knew. And... So shortly after that, you know, I went into a men's home and that's where I saw this verse. And, and, and in that verse that I just read, there the Apostle Paul says, I press forward. And I remember just beginning to realize, once I realized that that poem was actually a verse in the Bible, God's holy word, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to press forward. I, I don't ever want to go back to what, you know, what I lived. I don't forget where God brought me, but I don't want to go back to it. And I want to press forward. And that's what compelled me, you know, the power of God's word to continue to press forward, to just grow in my walk with God. And, and it was during that time that my hunger and thirst began to just grow for, for God's word. And, and little did I know, you know, that, that God would have a plan to put a call upon my life, you know, not just to be a Christian, not just to be a, a you know, a Christian husband and a Christian dad, right? But to be a pastor, man, that's a that's a whole trip in and in and of itself, right? Because I never I remember when when I was asked, you know, to pray about becoming a pastor, I was afraid. I was like, man, I better not tell nobody that I have a past of prison and everything, because I don't know if it's against the law or something, you know. But it's again, I think it's not it's not that it's against the law. It's just another testament of the grace of God, you know. And today, so it was 20 years ago, just this past June, that I celebrated 20 years of walking with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the, in the midst of this 20 years, you know, it hasn't been easy. I always tell people, man, being a Christian doesn't mean you're going to have an easy life. But I tell you what, it's going to be a better life. And today I have a better life because of Jesus. And I get to be a, a pastor of, a, of an amazing church called Hope Alive Church. And in the midst of all that, oh, I want to go back real quick, guys. In the midst of all that, God led me to Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And man, that was another trip. And I didn't know the plan that God had for me, but it was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa that God began to just grow me up in, in the call of, of God upon my life, right? And how God used Pastor Brian and so many others uh, to come alongside me and to encourage me. And it was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa where I began to just 
um, develop in in uh, the the call that God has for me and and being a minister. And it was during that time that God gave me a passion and a, and a heart for the city of Santa Ana, which isn't too far from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And and so we just had active ministry, you know, for about 10 years in the city of Santa Ana. And um, it was about 2013, early in the year, when Pastor Brian just gave, he encouraged me and he said, man, you should plant a church in Santa Ana. And, and that's what we've done. And so since 2014, I've been able to uh, have the privilege of serving the Lord in Santa Ana and, um, and interacting with a lot of young people. We do a lot of ministry to, to young people and in, in high schools. And one of the things that drives me for that is, is when I see a lot of these young people of what they're going through, it reminds me of some of the stuff that I went through. You know, um, just poverty to gangs, um, drugs, a sense of just loss and, and you know, emptiness. And uh, God has given me the opportunity to re really reach this community. And as a result of all of what God has been doing, man, I, it's just amazing that I have these wonderful relationships. You know, from one point I was a parolee and, and a criminal. Now some of my good friends are police officers, right? Um, I get to interact with a lot of city officials only for the purpose of what we can do to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, that's a little bit of my story right there. And... I would ask if you would continue to please pray, pray for Hope Alive Church, pray for God's people. You know, it's an exciting journey when, when we know that God takes us from darkness and brings us into light and we never know what God's going to be doing. But, you know, um, I pray for you. I pray for everyone who's watching this, that God would just bless you and encourage you as well. God bless you guys.